Beloved, let us join in our responsive call to worship. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Let us worship God. Beloved, let us join our hearts in prayer. Good and gracious God, your love for all of creation means that we experience your glory in the beauty of the things that we see, the sweet sounds that we hear, the aromatic smells that tickle our nostrils, the delicious flavors that we taste, and in each reviving breath that we take. While the tensions of the past day may cause us nightmares, your mercies are new every morning. Awaken our spirits to receive the good news that you would have preached in this pulpit today. Strengthen us to live out the truth of Christ's message, not only with those whom we choose, but also with all of your people who deserve our compassion and care. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. Beloved, there are times when we fail to do the things that Christ asks of us. And there are times when this world certainly falls short of the grace of God. But if we confess our sins before the Lord, we can trust that we will be forgiven in Jesus Christ. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. Almighty and most gracious God, we have erred and strayed from your ways. We have followed the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against our holy rules. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, Lord, as we confess our faults. Restore us to the joy of your salvation and enable us to live holy and upright lives. Amen. Beloved, who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. Having been reconciled with God, let us together state what it is that we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Beloved, Christ calls us to be reconciled to one another. Let us do so by sharing the peace. May the peace of Christ be with you.
Our first scripture reading is the book of, from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, for the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord. Beloved, as we prepare to lean on the everlasting arms of God, I invite you to look in your bulletin at the people who have requested prayer We extend Christian sympathy to Lynn and Bruce Clauser on the death of Lynn's mother. We pray for those who have been on the prayer list just a short time and those who have ongoing concerns. Our mission partners this week are Miss Edna, who works with Myers Tarts program, and Cindy Carell, who works with Fundama in Haiti. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. O tender and loving God, we thank you for the gracious gift of life and good health and for the peace and religious freedom that affords us the privilege to gather together to praise your name. We are thankful for your spirit's revelation of your truth to us. We thank you for sending your son to save us and to show us how to live and for the Holy Spirit who abides with us throughout our life journey to you. We seek refuge and solace in the everlasting arms from the stories of political unrest, war, injustice, and family separation that we hear so much about. 
Help us to remember that we are always in your care and that we should courageously negotiate for peace and justice. We pray for the people who live in countries that are aflame with conflict and war. We ask for the safety and protection of our women and men who are serving in the armed forces and are stationed around the world. We also lift up the many veterans who so bravely fought in the past. We pray for our political prisoners and for those who have been wrongfully incarcerated, both here in the United States and around our global village. We seek wisdom and courage for all who are involved in these situations. We pray trusting that your spirit knows the places where our acts of loving kindness are desperately needed. We raise up for your healing touch those who are struggling with physical and mental illness. Great physician, we raise up for your healing those who have been recently diagnosed with life-threatening illnesses, those who despair with the diagnosis of a chronic illness that may encroach on their independence. We lift up Jean, Emily, Baby Jenkins, Johnson, Magali, Helen, Nicole, Doris, Trisha, Frank, Jane, Bill, and Fred. We pray for all your children, Lord. Help us not to draw the line and limit our love and care to children that are biologically our own, for all of them are precious in your sight. We pray also for the families that have recently experienced the loss of loved ones. Embolden us to be the good Samaritan who advocates for justice, who visits those who are sick or lonely, who tells the old, old story of Jesus and his love for everyone, who prays without ceasing for family, friends, and those whom we may think of as enemies. We are called to see them as members of our own family, because Christ's death on the cross and resurrection was to redeem the whole world. We pray for our president and for the leaders of all the nations of the earth, that they may become instruments of change that will positively impact the people in their countries. We pray also for the pastors, elders, deacons, and other lay leaders of our church and the church universal. On this Sunday, may we find our lives changed through prayer, and may we be led by the Spirit to do your will now and always. Lord, we join these prayers that have been spoken with the ones that remain in the silent corners of our hearts, trusting that you will hear our petitions and praying in the words Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day for a beauty. Would a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Guess who I'm pretending to be? Who is it? No, it's not Daniel Tiger. <laughs> but Daniel Tiger's on his show. 
No, golly. Let me go, get some older kids. Who am I trying to be? Mr. Rogers. Okay, so Mr. Rogers. Okay, so Mr. Rogers had a show where he, he started his show every time by singing that song and putting on his sweater. And every time he said, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? See, we all knew it. <laughs> so I got to thinking when I first heard that song long, long time ago, how cool it would be to live next door to Mr. Rogers, to actually be Mr. Rogers' neighbor. Would have been so much fun. But here's the thing. I don't think Mr. Rogers was asking us all to move into the house next door because he was talking about a different kind of neighbor. He was asking all the kids in TV land to be his neighbor. And he was t telling us to all treat each other with the same kindness and the same love that we would with the people that live next door. How many of you have good neighbors at your house? Yeah, you got fun neighbors in the neighborhood, so it's fun. You know how fun it is to play with your neighbors. So, um, but here's the thing. Jesus, Jesus told this story first. Mr. Rogers didn't come up with this all on his own. Jesus said it first because the disciples, uh, Jesus said, uh, or the disciples said, what are we supposed to do? And Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And they said, well, who's my neighbor? And then he told the story that you know about the Good Samaritan and that the neighbor was not the person you expected. We're going to think more about that in Sunday school this morning. But for now, I want us to just remember that just like Mr. Rogers said, just like Jesus says, we need to love our neighbors. God will help us. Let's pray. God, we do thank you that you make the whole world our neighborhood, that there's really no one who's not our neighbor. So help us, Lord, to always, always be good neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen.
please be seated. Friends, grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a delight to see you this morning. If you are a guest with us, please know especially of your welcome. We are delighted that you are here, and if we can do anything uh, to make this a more welcoming place for you, if we can sit down with you and talk to you about life or faith or introduce you to a new friend, please do not hesitate to ask us. We'd be delighted to do so. We do ask that you find a ritual or friendship pad that's on the edge of your pew toward the center aisle to take it, to sign it, to share it with other people who are on your row, and then pass it back. And when you do, take a look and see who you're sitting with so you can introduce yourselves to each other after the worship service, perhaps make a new friend. Now, if you are guests, we'd love a little information about you. Perhaps an email address, um, a physical address, some way we can reach out to you and let you know what God is up to in this place. We promise not to besiege you with information, but we would like to reach out and let you know what God is up to in this place. As for our announcements, I would draw your attention to the bulletin shell and the variety of things that are going on in the life of the church. There's one I would like to highlight, which is this afternoon or directly after this worship service. So still technically in the morning, there will be an opportunity to visit um, Chanticleer Gardens with a group from the church. It's not too late to, to sign up right after the service if you're interested in going. Uh, but that'll be an opportunity for some fellowship and see one of the, the great gardens and God's beauty um, in the area. Now friends, as we take our morning offering, I would encourage you to think of the ways that uh, you steward the many blessings that God has given us, uh, to consider the ways that you might turn those back to God's work in the world, both in your financial resources, but also in your time and in your talent. Let's take it now.
Almighty God, you are the giver of all good gifts. We thank you for the blessings in our lives, and we are grateful that we are able to return a portion of those here with our time, our talents, and our financial gifts. May they be used to further your kingdom in this world so that all may know the love of Jesus Christ. It is in his strong name that we pray. Amen. Gracious God, teach us how to cast our crowns before you, how to open ourselves to the still more excellent way of your love, how to be shaped by your word. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Our lectionary passage this morning is one of our best stories from Luke 10. I invite you to listen for this word from God. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took uh, two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. A lawyer stands to test Jesus. He stands because that's what students did when they talked to superiors, to teachers of some sort. But the text alerts us that this question will be in bad faith because he tests him. He's not there to learn from him, even though he's presenting himself that way. He's there to ask this question so he knows where he stands around certain questions. So we can classify him or dismiss him or call him just, you know, one of those. And it's an awkward question, perhaps a bad question, intended to create confusion. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a bad question because what can you do to inherit anything? Inheritance is a gift. It must be waited on. Jesus sees this and evades him. He responds in a typical rabbinical fashion. He answers the question with another question. He says, you're an expert in the law. What do you read in the law? 
And here he gives a summation, a common summation of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. To which Jesus replies, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. It is a common summation of the law. It's what Jesus himself will give when someone asks him what is the most important commandment. In fact, it's so common in Judaism that we see it from several teachers. It's the combination of two of the most important scriptures within Judaism. The Shema, which is recited every day in Jewish liturgy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And then in combination with Leviticus 19.18, which Rabbi Akiva, one of the most influential of the rabbis, called the single most important scripture in the Hebrew scriptures. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two are often put together, not because they are uh, uh, sort of neatly paired, but what they do is they mirror the Ten Commandments. Sometimes we talk about the two tablets of the commandments, the duties that we render to God. You shall have no other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Do not use the Lord's name in vain. And then the thou shall nots, those things that we have to render to other people. And here, in a positive form, they're described as love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's a good answer. But there's a fascinating thing about Leviticus 19.18. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, Hebrew is actually written without vowels, or at least it was in Jesus' time. And if you were to take the vowels out of a story in English, you could probably read it, especially if you already knew what it said. You could figure it out. They didn't write the vowels down. The word for neighbor, it's only two letters. It's a ratio and an ayin. Uh, it seems confusing. But usually it wasn't a problem. But... Every once in a while, it creates a moment of confusion or debates. And rabbis love to debate, and lawyers love to argue, and so here's this perfect opportunity. And the perfect opportunity becomes because one of the words for enemy, one of the words for enemy or a stranger that you are worried might do your harm, is also a resh and an ayin. Its vowels are different, like fit versus fat, but there is a way to read this incredibly important piece of Hebrew scripture that starts this way. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge as you shall love your enemy as yourself. You shall love the stranger as yourself. And so a lawyer comes to test Jesus and Jesus prompts from him a summation of the law and then asks him, how do you read that? Where, what do you read there? Do you read it as neighbor? Or do you read it as enemy? Do you read it as the one who is fairly easy to love? Or the one that is hard to love? Jesus will show us in many places that he reads it as enemy. The lawyer hedges them. He says neighbor, but again, he's there to test Jesus, to tease out what it is he believes so that he can classify him or dismiss him or attack him. He wants to justify this questioning, and so he says, tell me, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Is it neighbor or is it enemy? And I'm glad he asked that question, because it is a question that stretches through all of human history, in every culture, in every location, in every time. And our answer to that question, without reservation, neighbor or enemy, has always been neighbor. It's true, because when we become afraid, 
When we become anxious, we almost always to choose to go with what we think of as our own kind, people who look like us or act like us or sound like us. We, we tend to congregate with people who think like us and watch the same news shows as us. I used to live in Memphis, which was a site of one of the most racially charged uh, acts of the, the last century, the murder of Martin Luther King. And so race plays an enormous role in that city. And while I was there, I read this article. I was unable to find it online, but it, it's about race in public schools. And the basic premise of the article was this, is that kids who go to school with kids of other races who experience diversity in the classroom, naturally, what do you think? They naturally become less welcoming and tolerant of people of other races. That's not what I expected. But kids notice differences and they self-segregate. You only have to go to a lunchroom to see that. But the article went on to say that at some point, if you describe to kids that they're working on the same team, that they're working toward a similar goal, what happens is that they flip. They become far more tolerant and loving of someone different than them, than the student who was never given this opportunity. This is probably why sports were so important to the integration efforts in the United States. And why as Christians, we describe believers as family. You're part of who I am. Indeed, for Christians, we have been given a mandate, quite literally. Jesus says, I give you new commandment, that you should love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you, being the critical point of that statement, as I have loved you, as I have loved all of you. It's interesting to me that this is the very gospel, that at the end, Jesus will be on the cross between two criminals. Father, forgive them, he will say here. Today you will be with me in paradise, he will say. Jesus believes in reaching beyond those who look and think and act like him to make enemies into neighbors, to make the other into family. And that is what he actually tries to do with a lawyer in this scenario. This lawyer who has presented himself as a student but is there to test him, to potentially entrap him, to dismiss him. Who is my neighbor? Jesus tells him one of our best stories. A man is left for dead. A, piece, a priest passes by on the other side. He does not say why. A Levite is next, also passes by, does not say why. Perhaps we'll take that up in another sermon. Now, because this is such a famous story, it is usually seared into our brains before we ever get to really hear it for the first time. If you are hearing the story for the first time, I'm envious of that. Because the rest of us always hear this and know that the third person is a Samaritan. I mean, we call it the Good Samaritan. It's a spoiler right in the title. But this is not what the lawyer would have expected. The lawyer would have expected Jesus to answer his question, who is my neighbor? The lawyer would have expected the third classification, the Levite and the priest, the third one to be a lawyer specific to him or an Israelite specific to the crowd listening to this story. But Jesus didn't answer his question. Because answering his question would have created a conflict. He could not have made his enemy into a family member. Jesus reframes this question. See, the lawyer can extrapolate from the first two examples. This man is unknown to the priest and the Levite. His spiritual betters 
the ones that he follows. And if the priest and the Levite excuse themselves from assisting, then he won't need to. Simple. So it comes as a shock when Jesus shifts the enemy, the neighbor, from the one who is in the ditch to the one who shows mercy. Not just the neighbor, but the enemy. If the lawyer is expecting to hear himself in the story, there's a sudden switch. And there's only one person left for him to be. The lawyer is the one face down in the ditch, hoping against hope that someone is kind enough to quell their fears and save his life. So the question was, who is my neighbor, Jesus? But the answer is, who has been my neighbor? And this may not seem much to you, but the shift tells the lawyer he isn't the one who gets to delineate who is his neighbor. That he can't use the law as this shield from caring about certain people who are different than him. What we get to care about can't be answered without discovering who also chooses to care about us. We don't get to draw the lines just by ourselves. And we have to remember that often we are the ones in need of help. See, we're Christians. And we each have this decision to make. We can show mercy or we can choose not to show mercy. But we shouldn't deceive ourselves. The whole of the gospel falls on the side of showing mercy. I want to tell you a story I have told you once before, but it's worth hearing again. Andre Trocmé became a pastor in a small French town called Le Chambon, which was a Huguenot city in France. That's essentially a Presbyterian city in France. He became their pastor in 1934, and for six years he built social capital as a religious leader in a very small rural farming community. One day he would trade that social capital when the Vichy government began imposing harsh anti-Semitic laws from the Nazi regime. In 1940, Trochme and his assistant pastor, Edward Tice, went to an internment camp in France to see how they might help, and the Red Cross advised them that they needed help caring for Jews who were being released from the camp because they were unable to work. This was obviously very early in the war. But also to care for the children of the adult Jews who had been shipped off to hard labor camps. So Trachme and Tice readily agreed. Word got out that there might be a sympathetic reaction to refugees in Le Chambon and Jewish refugees started showing up in the town. Now, most of the people in this town were descendants of refugees from centuries before. That's how you end up with a Presbyterian town in France. And they responded very well to Trochme's employment of this social capital. The town became a refuge. After two years, the government caught on. They sent a representative that showed up and demanded from Trochme that he turn over all the Jews in the town. He refused, and eventually the official left. Trochme knew he would be back soon, and so he gathered all the small boys at the town, and he sent them to the neighboring farms to let them know, to warn them about the impending search. And indeed, the next day, German troops showed up and searched the town the surrounding countryside. They searched for three weeks, and they only took two people into custody. Hundreds had been saved. This event 
showed the people of that town that they needed to be even more focused on the saving of these lives. Their efforts intensified. The assistant pastor, Tice, pioneered escape routes into Switzerland. The people of the town used their gifts to forge documents and travel papers to help move the Jews into safety. And then the next year, in 1943, the Gestapo showed up and arrested the pastors and sent them to prison. They offered them a deal. They said, if you simply acknowledge publicly that you will follow the Vichy government, we will let you go. They refused. By some miracle, they were released later anyway. The government continued to intensify their searches and one day found one of the schools that the Trachme family had set up to educate these Jewish children. Eighteen of them were sent off and the teacher, a cousin of the pastor, Daniel Trochme, was executed. It continued to grow worse. An underground fighter warned the pastors that they had been marked by, uh, for assassination. And so they left Le Chambon and they wandered incognito around the French countryside for about a year. But even as they were gone, their community of faith continued to care for the refugees. They had learned what it meant to follow in the way of Christ. To love their neighbor that did not look like them, or act like them, or sound like them. They had learned to love as Christ loved them. The pastors were able to return the next year, a few months before France was liberated. And in all, it is believed that that small rural farming community saved the lives of 5,000 people during the war. Because of their compassion, because of their bravery, because of their commitment to the still more excellent way of love. Jesus asked the lawyer, uh, Jesus tests the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Jesus says to us, go and do likewise.
Friends, as you go from this place, may our Lord Jesus Christ go with you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, beneath you to lift your spirits, and before you to show you the path of the still more excellent way. Friends, go in peace.